Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. I'm absolutely exhausted in the minute. It has been the longest week and I'm very like socially drained, if that makes sense. You know you know what I mean when you've been around people too much or out of the house too much and I'm just very, very tired. So today we're doing a relaxed video. We're doing one that I've been wanting to do for a little while and it's just a little Q&A because I haven't done one of these in forever. I'm going to be doing my makeup as we do it or as we talk. You know what I'm trying to say. Words. Woods is. I'm gonna be doing yellow makeup today, which is pretty fun because I adore the color yellow. You know this; it's not my favorite color. And I just bought this beautiful new yellow jumper that I wanna do a cool makeup look to go with it. I love this so much. It is stunning. Look at it; it's beautiful. Yeah, and I'm gonna be answering some of your questions that you guys gave me on Instagram as we as we do it. So thanks for being here. Hopefully, we can talk about some interesting stuff. Okay, we're going to be doing this in no particular order, just basically the order they got sent to me on Instagram and I'm going to cover as many as possible. First question I got was, oh it's about Kyra, this is lovely. How come you decided to adopt a grown dog and not a puppy? So, many, many reasons for this. So as many of you might know, I adopted Kyra just after her fifth birthday. So she was already kind of like older and an adult and I, when I was looking at all the different shelters, especially Battersea, I knew I wanted to adopt an adult dog because I love puppies, don't get me wrong, they're wonderful, but they are a lot of work and at the time I was with Dan and he'd never had a dog before so I didn't know if I wanted to like throw him straight into puppy training because it's a lot of effort, definitely, and it takes a lot of time and you need a lot of patience. But also, and this sounds horrible, but with a puppy you don't necessarily know what you're getting. You can tell a little bit of their personality from how they act and how they behave and stuff, but you don't really know exactly who they're going to be until they're a lot older. Whereas with Kyra, she was already like grown up and she had this personality. And so once I met her and fell in love with her personality, I was like, this is just who she is. She's not going to change. She's not going to be a different dog at home. We're not going to be incompatible in that way. So because I already knew that me and Kyra had this personality that gelled and matched and we'd want the same life, I knew it was going to work, you know? The other big thing is that in general, adult dogs tend to be a little bit overlooked in favour of puppies, which is really sad. And Battersea and other dogs' homes have a hell of a lot of adult dogs and a hell of a lot of staffies. And they are ones that do, like I say, tend to be overlooked. It takes them longer to be adopted and find homes. Um, and so I kind of wanted to focus on those dogs, the ones that get overlooked a little bit and the ones that aren't just going to be snapped up straight away. You know, I, I, I like I like the underdogs. I like the ones that are a little bit different. That said, from the moment I met Kyra, I was like, I can't imagine anyone not wanting her and loving her and just, you know, falling in love the minute they meet her. So, but I don't know, maybe I'm just biased because I love her so much. So yeah, they're the big main reasons. Um, one, because they're often overlooked and I want to give an, an older dog a home. Uh, two, because you already get to know their personality and who they are and you could make sure you're a really good compatible match. And three, um, just being that it's a little bit easier when it comes to training and they're often, not always, but often a little bit less work than a puppy, or at least less demanding. The next question is, what are some good feminist books you'd recommend? Oh, this is a great question because I'm reading some really, really good ones at the minute. So at the moment I am reading uh, Why Are Women Blamed for Everything by... Let me get you the author name, uh, Dr. Jessica Taylor, and it's fantastic. It's all about basically the culture behind victim blaming and why we have this victim blaming mentality and why when it comes to things like assaults and domestic violence, we have such a tendency to blame the victim, mostly when those victims are women, but also sometimes when they're men as well. And it's just an absolutely fascinating read and it's a little bit terrifying. And as you know, it's one which touches on topics which are kind of close to my heart and sometimes a little bit difficult for me to read, but understanding kind of why people have these beliefs and how we can combat them is really, really important and really useful, I find, because I still remember when the first time I like spoke out about the fact that Johnny had abused me and hurt me and made my life hell, he responded with death threats and threatening my career and all sorts of stuff. And it was, it was messy and I had a bit of a breakdown over it because I was literally scared for my life. And after getting the police involved as well, I, and I, at the time, like, I did a little live stream basically saying, like, look, my ex is doing this. Kind of to cover my back, so basically I was like, if anything happens to me, he did it. And I was, I was terrified and I didn't know what to do, and I was just sort of panicking, and I was like, because he was threatening, he was like, I could say all, anything I wanted, and, like, would ruin your career, because I can say what I want, and I can make up what I want, and he was threatening to release, like, intimate images of me, and he was threatening my life as well, so I, I was in, like, panic mode, and I was like, 
clearly he wants to silence me, so I'm not gonna be silent. And I spoke up about it and I basically said very publicly like, if he makes anything up, it's not true because this is what happened. If he releases images, no, it's without my consent. And if anything happens to me, he's the one who did it. I was basically just sort of trying to cover all my bases like that because I was terrified. And most people were wonderful and supportive and lovely. But um, once I announced that I'd gone to the police, um, I had this influx of comments from, unsurprisingly, mostly men who were saying that I deserved it, I shouldn't have provoked him, clearly I was the one who was making him angry, um, I clearly deserved it, this is what I get for being a feminist, um, you know, all, all sorts of stuff like that, and it was absolutely horrible. Um, even one of the police officers I spoke to on the phone asked me what I'd done to provoke the death threats, and I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, well, clearly you must have done something to make him angry enough to threaten you. And I'm like, so you're saying it's my fault he's threatening to kill me? And she was like, well, you have to take a little bit of personal responsibility, don't you? And I'm like, for a man wanting to kill me, I have to take responsibility. And it was disgusting and it was horrific and I was very, very angry about it. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm finally ready to hear about this stuff and read about this stuff from a more academic perspective. Um, because this book basically is just an easier to, ver easier to read version of her PhD thesis that she worked on for years. So really, really good book, really interesting stuff. And I'm in a place to actually take it all in and, you know, learn now, which is nice and it feels good makes me feel stronger and it's good to kind of be equipped in understanding these issues, you know? So that's one that I recommend. Um, another question was, do you think you'd ever get a second dog? Kyra is so cute, by the way. Oh, thank you. She is so cute. But maybe I'm biased, but thank you. I love hearing people compliment Kyra because I get like, I feel like such a proud mum and I'm like, oh good, everyone else can see what I do and it's lovely. But no, I, I don't think I'd get a second dog. Kyra, she likes her space and she likes her independence and she likes having me all to herself. She's a very, very cuddly dog and she's very, um, she's, she's very much a mummy's girl. And I don't think she'd necessarily enjoy having another dog around all the time. Like, she's not. She's not bad with other dogs. She's very well behaved. She doesn't really bother with them. But I think she'd just get a bit tired having one in her space all the time. So I'm fine. Like, well, rather, she's fine if I, like, babysit a friend's dog or something for an afternoon. Or um, playing out in the garden with the other pups or something. There's a few in particular that she just absolutely adores and always wants to be around, which is nice. She's a, she's getting, like, a little bit older now. And she likes her space and she likes her independence. And, yeah, I don't think I'd want to bring in another dog that she felt she had to compete with at all. You know, I kind of want... I sort of feel like these are her retirement years. And I just want her to be able to have fun and relax. And know that this is her home and her safe space. And, you know, for just me and her to have our little adventures together and stuff. I do love dogs, though. And... I think I will get another one in the future after Kyra eventually, but not at the same time and probably not for a little while because, you know, she's my entire world. This is a loaded question and I'm not sure I should answer this one. Um, what are the biggest internal issues that the atheist community has feels so toxic? So I, I haven't really been in touch with too many people from like the atheist side of YouTube um, recently. I'm still sort of in two minds about whether to go to Faithless Forum this year because like on the one hand I do want to and my initial response was like yes absolutely I, I miss it and I do miss the people I met there who you know so, some people are so lovely like Thomas and Steve and Shannon and everyone and um, and I would absolutely love to see those guys again but one I don't know if the travel ban is going to be lifted um, to get into America so that's a thing to consider and two I don't know, it just feels like there's a lot of drama amongst like the atheist community at the minute and I don't really want to be involved in that. It's already been a drama filled year and I really don't want more of it. I don't know if Jimmy's going to be invited, but if he is I don't really want to see him. So that's something I'm thinking about, but that's like more of a personal issue that I have. I think there is though, and there has been since the whole essence of thought thing, this weird like split in the atheist community where you have certain people who are like you have to do everything our way and everything else is wrong and if you don't do it our way you're a bad person you're a terrible person and it's like very much like fundamentalist christians which is odd but they they still have that mindset and it's very very weird and they tend to kind of like eat themselves because they don't allow any kind of like discussion of ideas they don't allow anyone with like opposing ideas in there they're just very kind of angry at everyone. So I think that's a huge problem that the atheist community in some parts has. Not everyone's like that though. 
there are some people who are just more open to differing ideas and stuff. But even within that side of things, it feels like everyone's just very quick to judge. And it's like, if someone does one thing wrong, everyone kind of jumps on them and is angry at them rather than like sitting down and saying, hey, why do you feel this way? How do we combat it? And I think you have to remember that like with a lot of atheist creators, a lot of what people are doing is very like, it's gonna sound silly, but it's very emotionally fueled because they've come out of religion, they're deconverting or they haven't been deconverted long or they're still holding a lot of anger towards certain religions or religious practices. And that's why I think maybe certain people can be a little bit snarkier than they need to or why, I don't know, why some people take things a little too far or too extreme. But on the other hand, you have people like, um, say like me and Steve, for example, who've never been like religious. We were never brought up like in a religious setting. We've never like been in that environment. So to us, some of the things that we take for granted or some of the things that we're like, oh, I don't quite get why people are upset about that. The fact that we don't necessarily understand that stuff can be a little offensive to some people as well. And so again, I think there's just kind of a lot of gatekeeping in places and it's a little bit difficult, but on the whole, I think most people are wonderful. There's a lot of stuff with the ACA that I really do not understand at all. So even when I was in Texas, I don't really, like, so this was two years ago, back in 2019. I've never been all that like aware of what the ACA does or who they are until I was there. And then I was like, oh, okay, so now I'm learning. And at the time, like, it seemed like a really sort of good, useful organization that was helping a lot of people. But then after we left, there was like lots of weird stuff going on and there was stuff with like electing people and then drama and then people saying this and this and I was just like, yeah, okay, maybe it's a little shadier than it seemed on the surface to an outsider. I didn't really understand anything that was going on and I sort of just stepped away from getting involved in any of that stuff. And even now I keep hearing bits of like people saying, oh, what do you think about what's going on with like so-and-so and so-and-so? And I'm like, I have no idea about anything that's happening with anyone. I just don't really understand and I don't really want to be involved in any of that like dramery type stuff so yeah. Okay on to a lighter question and um, this one is what got you interested in poetry? A specific poem or author? Um, so for my... Uh, I've always loved poetry like even when I was a kid I read all these poetry books and but it was always like kids poetry and I never quite made that transition to sort of like more grown-up poetry until I was about 16. I had this wonderful English teacher and um, I'm gonna do my eyeliner and then tell you the story because I'm not very good at talking and doing this at the same time. I guess I'll do. Um, yeah, so I had this like awful English teacher at GCSE who, she was just a pretty bad teacher. She never really taught us anything. She didn't get as interested in the subject. She was off like a hell of a lot. She was just never in class. And she literally made me hate the subject. And I did not enjoy those lessons at all. And I thought, I thought I hated English and English Lit. Turns out I just hated her classes. So I was like miserable for the first year of doing my GCSEs and then in the last year she had some like stuff going on, I don't know what, obviously we were kids we weren't told but you know I think she got better afterwards so that's good but she just stopped turning up to classes for like four months and we had like a whole crap load of substitute teachers and it was like changing every week and it was a nightmare and then the school finally got like a permanent replacement in and his name was Warren and he was fantastic. And he absolutely made me fall in love with poetry. And he he had like such a tough job because we went to like the top class in the year and we were months behind everyone else. We were months behind where we should be. Um, but he was wonderful and he helped me so much and he helped me just like fall in love with poetry again and really understand it and really enjoy it and he'd recommend poems to me that he thought I'd like r relate to or get something out of and he, he'd like stay after class with me and help me with like extra bits because I was really struggling and I thought English was going to be like the subject that let me down but thanks to him I like managed to get an A which was good wasn't as good as my other subjects but it was good and I would not have done that without him um, but mostly he just ignited my love for reading again and my love for poetry and it's because of him I took English at A level which I thoroughly enjoyed and loved. And from that, it was mostly down to Mrs. Cunliffe and Mr. Brooke. Loved those two. They were wonderful teachers, wonderful people, so supportive in every way. And again, Mr. Brooke was one of those people who helped me fall in love with poetry again. He taught us like the John Donne poems and I just thought they were wonderful. He's a fantastic teacher. So him, Warren, Cunliffe, those three are why I love poetry as much as I do today. They take a hell of a lot of the credit.
Okay, next question is, I'd love to try a hand at art, but I'm too afraid I'll end up wasting my supplies. Any tips to get over it? Oh my God, this is so relatable. This is just absolutely me. I was like this for so long. The best thing I found to kind of get over it is, especially when you're trying like a new medium, buy, buy a cheap like version of it and just see if you kind of like enjoy it and know that your art's not gonna be as good anyway because you're not using like the best stuff. Um, you'll find there are some limitations, but using a cheap version it kind of just gets you used to it and it gets you like feeling a little more free and a little more creative and you've got to kind of, I don't know, just make sure you're enjoying yourself which is good. And then once you're a little bit more confident and comfortable you can go on and buy more expensive stuff that you don't worry about wasting because you've already got a lot of the skills at that point and you can kind of step up your art. But even regardless of what you're using it is really daunting and especially when a piece of artwork doesn't go your way and it doesn't turn out the way you want like so I painted this one the other day and lots of people have like commented saying they really like it but it's just I see a lot of problems with it and I had such high hopes for this because I love peacocks and I wanted to do all these bright colours and it just didn't quite turn out the way I wanted like the shape of the body down here just doesn't quite work right for me I don't like this flow of the feathers here. I kind of wish I brought them more down this way. I, I kind of wish there was more of an obvious swoop of the tail, so that's an issue with my composition. And I'm just seeing all these faults, but I could look at something like this and be like, well, I wasted my time, I wasted my materials, and I could get really down on myself. Or I can be like, no, you know what? I had fun with the process of making it. It's taught me a hell of a lot, and it's not a waste as long as I enjoyed it and had fun with it, right? And I learned something along the way. So I have a big thing where like, Every time I finish a painting, I go through it and I kind of like really like critically analyze it and I get really like harsh with myself. So I'll go through and be like, okay, well I like this bit and I like this bit, I don't like this. Here's what I could have done better. Next time I'm gonna do this, this and this. And I keep like notes on my phone for like things that I wanna improve and stuff. So after a few paintings, once I've seen something that I keep doing wrong, I'll make like a conscious effort to get better at it so I'll go look up a tutorial or I'll read a book or I'll watch videos on how to get better at that particular thing and it just helps me grow and uh, improve a bit more. But I think that's the thing when it comes to like the idea of wasting supplies, it's not a waste as long as you're growing, learning and having fun. So even if your art turns out to be something that you don't like, it's okay, you can still take something out of it and get something out of it and in that sense it's never going to be a waste. All right, I think that's the makeup done. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple more questions to, to end this video on. Oh, this one's sweet. Um, is Kyra a trained support animal or are you two just super in tune with each other? Yeah, no, she's, she's not trained in that way at all. She's just a regular dog. But because me and her spend so much time together, we're just both very in tune with each other, each other's feelings, and we just understand each other, you know? So little things like her grunts and grumbles, or the way she snorts in a certain way, I can tell exactly what she wants from little things like that and she can tell with me as well so we have like whole little conversations where like she'll grumble at me and I'll speak to her and then we're like mm, okay okay we get it and then you know it's it's very sweet she knows what I'm feeling she knows what I want she knows like how to look after me and hopefully I know the same and do the same for her I think it's just when you spend all day every day with someone you get to know them very very well and that's, that's how it is with Coops you know I love her. Um, this person says, top poetry book recommendations. There are far too many for me to go over right now, but if you go to my website, rachelotes.uk, you can get a whole page of my poetry recommendations on there, and I split it up into different parts, so I'm still adding to it constantly, but there's bits for anthologies, there's bits for specific collections by specific poets on there, and there's lots and lots of different options for books that I recommend and love, and you can, you can go check that stuff out for yourself if you want. What are your feelings on adopting children in the far future? Um, I mean, if I ever had kids, they would be adopted. I would never, ever, ever go through pregnancy myself. I love people who adopt. I think it's fantastic, but I just can't see myself ever doing it, to be honest. I don't think I ever want to be a parent, and it's just not something I ever see for myself at all. It just... no. And I mean, that, that causes issues, you know, especially when it comes to, like, dating. I have been dumped more times than I can count because of the kids thing. And like, even when you bring it up straight away, there's still certain men who will like lie to you and tell you they don't want kids. And then like a month in, it's like, oh wait, maybe I do want kids and it screws you over. So it's difficult. Um, and it's weird because it's really got me like being incredibly insecure because after a while when, when everyone keeps breaking up with you for the same reason, you start to think, well, is there something wrong with me? 
am I the one at fault? And, and you start thinking like, is there something like missing in me? Am I like not a real woman? Am I not enough? And it does like mess with your head like a hell of a lot. And it's something that like, yeah, I've just been going through a lot recently. And it's, it's messed me up a bit, which is difficult. I met someone that I thought was like pretty much perfect and wonderful. And it was like, you know, a friend of a friend. And I thought like, oh, he's great. And you know, we, we saw each other a few times and I brought up the kids thing straight away. And then like, after a month, he was like, oh, by the way, actually, maybe I do want kids. Just thought you should know. And I'm like, great, so you just spent the last month, like, lying to me and just kind of using me. And it hurt me a lot. And I've been a bit of a mess since. But then again, you spend more time alone and you become, like, more comfortable in yourself and who you are. And once you don't have men telling you you're wrong for not wanting something, you start to realise how right you are and how much you know yourself. And the more time I spend both with myself and other people and out in the world, the more I realise that like, no, I really, really don't want kids. Especially when I see people with kids and I'm just like, none of that is for me. None of the bad stuff, none of the good stuff, I don't want it. And I've realised that I'd rather be alone and happy and comfortable and not have children that I regret than be with someone and feel forced into having kids that I don't want and regret that, you know? I see a lot of people talking about things like how, oh, well, what if you regret not having kids? I'm like, well, if I do, then that's what happens. And I'm the only one who gets hurt in that. But imagine if I actually had kids and then regretted it. Like, that's a horrible thing to put kids through. And that's hurting myself, that's hurting my partner, that's hurting the kids, and that's horrible. So if it's a matter of, I could regret it either way, I'd rather I'm the only one getting hurt in that, but I don't think I will at all. It's just, it's not something I want for myself, ever. I don't, I don't see it. Uh, what's one place in the world you would love to visit but haven't yet? Austria. It just looks really beautiful. I'd really like to go. Favourite animal to paint? Um, obviously octopuses. I love octopuses so much and I paint them all the time. But at the minute I'm going through a bit of a stage painting birds and I'm really enjoying that. So I've done a lot of watercolour birds at the minute. The peacock was a big step up and that was hard. We'll get there with him. I'm going to give him another go. It's going to be good. Would you get another degree if money, time, etc. wasn't an issue and what degree? Honestly, I think, yeah, maybe I'd like to go back and do something a little bit crazy like study sort of like animal behavior or like just something to do with working with animals. I think that would be great. I'd love to do that. Or I would take something like an art or a media course, something that would be really fun, you know, just something, something for funsies, you know, something that I'm actually passionate about. And so something I feel that I have to like be, that I'm sort of forced into. What's your favorite media to create art with? Obviously photography is always going to be my first love and my first passion and I adore it. And I went to uh, York this Wednesday by myself, which was nice. And I had a day just like taking photos and visiting the museums and that was really fun. Um, but other than that, I kind of go through stages. But I always keep coming back to watercolour. I really, really enjoy watercolour. I think it's so versatile. I think it's really fun. I enjoy all the layering. But I'm not always good with the patience needed for waiting, like, for layers to dry. So that's something that I struggle with. But other than that, I really do enjoy watercolour. It's a lot of fun. Who do you think was or is the best British Prime Minister since you're from the UK? Oh my god, can I say none of them? They're all a bunch of, like, rich, spoiled white boys who come from like privileged little backgrounds, except Margaret Thatcher, who was a rich, spoiled white woman who was like an absolute bitch, a heartless bitch who cares about no sorry, okay. I have a problem with most politicians in the UK. I think they're horrible people who came from too much money, who don't understand how real people live and work and what our lives are like. They don't understand working class people at all, even the ones who say they do. And so they don't actually take people into consideration. I think it's an issue. We have all these little Eton boys all running the country and they don't know what the real world's like. They don't know what the country they're running is actually like and I think it's a huge problem. So it's a whole rant for another day though. <laughs> okay, I think I've got time for like maybe one more question. Oh, this is a fantastic one. Yeah, how do you handle feelings of self-doubt and navigate them in a healthful way, emotionally speaking slash practically? <sighs> this is tough and this is a really big one that I do still struggle with. I, I have so much self-doubt and I, I struggle constantly, but I find sometimes it's better to like talk through my feelings and address them and get them out rather than just leave them bottled in. So I often do things like I film videos that I know I'm never gonna post or I have journals and I write and write and write and get my feelings out to deal with it all. And I let myself have a little bit of time to wallow and then I try and move on and be a little more, little more practical in it. It's 
it's hard and I do struggle with like self-doubt a lot and I, I worry constantly and I have like crazy imposter syndrome and I feel so out of my depth sometimes but then other times I'm like well okay I know I've got like more skill than some people doing this or I know I'm more intelligent than some people doing this so I'm like so why why am I not as successful and then you get self-doubt in other ways and you're like okay well maybe this isn't enough maybe I'm just missing something maybe there's something inherently wrong with me it's like a whole big cycle and it just goes round and round <laughs> and I don't know I find that just at least getting my emotions out and not letting them just sit in my head and fester is a huge thing and then just to kind of keep coming back to remembering that like I am very very lucky and privileged to do the job that I do and when I'm not getting in my own head about it and overthinking everything I do really really have fun with it and I really enjoy it and I love like researching the bigger videos even when they don't get as many views and I love the writing process and I love filming and talking and entertaining and all this kind of thing so once I kind of like remember all that and kind of ground myself again I appreciate it so much and it helps and I'm like you know what e even if I'm bad at such and such a thing I'm good at this thing instead and so I, I try and focus on that for a while and that's kind of what helps me but I'm not perfect at it and I'm still learning and I'm still growing and that's another thing to remember even when I can recognize the skills I don't have now I know that I can work on them in the future hopefully and get better and keep going with it which is a good thing I think I don't know we'll see um but anyway oh actually this is another thing one of the things I think I struggle with is making my videos like clickable enough and kind of slightly clickbaity and because I, I worry about people kind of like well there are a lot of people who criticize your work just based on the thumbnail and the title and they leave like horrible comments I'm like you didn't watch the video did you and stuff like that or people will be like good video but the uh, the title was a bit too clickbaity so like when I do stuff like that and it does get the views I'm like brilliant it's working but everyone hates it and then other times I'm just like you know you you do a video with like not such a clickbaity title but just like an accurate title and it doesn't get views and you're like great put in all this work for nothing it doesn't pay off like pe some people said to me at the time like when I made the you know Gabby Hanna's Poetry's Bad video like that title worked, that worked so well and it got the views and it got people clicking and then snuck in a little sneaky education when they weren't expecting it. Um, but then some people are like, why couldn't you just call it Gabby Hanna Book Review? I'm like, because no one would have clicked on that. No one cares about that. They want to know why I think her poetry is bad. You need to hook them with that emotional response. And so it's kind of like a damned if you do, damned if you don't, you know? You make your titles clickbaity and people get angry about it. You don't and no one watches them. So you need to find this balance. And this is something that I really, really struggle with. So like for this video, I don't think people will just watch like a Q&A video. So now I'm having to start thinking like, okay, well, do I pick out certain questions that I answered here and like try and make them clickbaity? Do I make something emotional? Or are people gonna be like, oh, I can't believe like I clicked on this when it was just this and you advertise it as this. Like, I don't know, I don't know what to do. See, all the, all the doubt coming in again. It's hard. I don't know, we'll see, we will see. Anyway, that's the final point that I'm gonna end this on. Thank you so much for watching today. I appreciate you guys a hell of a lot. Um, let me know what other videos you would like to see from me now and in the future down in the comments below and um, If you're new here, please subscribe. That would be great. You can follow me on other social media I am most active over on Instagram where I post lots of photos of me and makeup and books that I'm reading and Kyra and Photos that I've taken of stuff. So it's quite fun if you if you like that kind of thing But for now, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys again soon.